Now we're good. Um, yeah, so this is 9.2 hashing. Hashing is probably uh, one of the most, I think, how would you put it? Um, like, okay, so here's the thing. In the, in the real world, I hate that phrase because it makes it sound like we're living in a fake world. If you're dealing with languages like Python or other scripting languages or Java, whether you're doing it now or you'll do it in the future, a, a majority of the time, not a majority, a lot of the time you are actually going to be using structures like objects or dictionaries or hash maps or hash tables, all of these different things. And you've, you've done this already if you've used Python, which are implemented essentially with hashing, which is what we're about to talk about now. Because um, all those other data structures like binary trees and um, uh, sets, I guess, and well, sets can be both, but lists and arrays, they're all, they're all a different type of data structure that are implemented with kind of different ideas behind them. Um, so hashing is something, whether you understand this or not today, you're going to be using substantially all the time um, in your general programming life. And that's, that's kind of why we want to talk about it today. Uh, so we can actually explore it and explore and contrast that to like ordered or sequential data structures. So we're going to be talking about what hashing is. We're going to be talking about the data structure or data structures that use hashing and then some of the challenges associated with data structures that use hashing because like all data structures, there's some challenges. Uh, it just depends on what it is. Before we get into that though, what's really important is to try and distinguish between ordered and associative containers because pretty much most containers that we've dealt with so far, maybe with the exception of graphs and they're kind of neither, um, are ordered containers or what we sometimes might refer to as sequential containers. Right? Um, so trees, linked lists, arrays, and what that means is that the items actually have a sense of um, kind of like they're ordered and I don't mean this in the sense that like it's sorted. There's a difference between a sorted array and an unsorted array and a sequential container because a sequential container essentially just means that you could apply a meaningful index to it. So like a linked list, right? It doesn't have indexes, but you, you it has a sense of sequence to it. This element goes to this element goes to this element. You could print it out in some order some repeatable, demonstrable order. An array is obviously in order because there's all these indexes to it. A binary tree, even though you couldn't, like, even though it's like this mishmash tree thing, you could still print those elements out, pre-order, whatever, and you could assign numbers to them. It's, it's indexable, is the point. Um, that's what an order or sequential container is. Um, where an associative container differs, is an associative container doesn't really have all these elements where you could apply, you know, an index or a sequence to it, but rather it's it's honestly just a cesspool of keys that point to particular values. So you just got to think about it like a big pile of, of stuff on the ground and inside that stuff is just a collection of like this particular key, usually a string, points to this value. This particular thing points to that value. Um, you, you're probably used to this data structure without even realizing it a lot of the time, right? Like one of the most obvious examples that I've just put here is mapping months to values. Like pretty much any time you have tried to take something that's non-arithmetic, like not indexable, not an int, and associate it with a particular value, you're, you're dealing with an associative container. Now you might be doing this via... Um, you know, a common way that someone might do a structure like this in, in say, C is that you create two arrays, right? And the first array has 13 elements in it, and they're all char stars. And then the second array has 13 elements in it, and they're all values, right? And then those two, in, they, the, the indexes line up. So, you know, the first array's index 0 gives you the string, the second array's index 0 gives you the value, and so forth. Now, that's, that's a way that you might try and solve this problem of trying to have some non-integer data correlate to another piece of integer data. But most generally when we're talking about associative containers or whatever, um, we're saying that it's when you can link something that's typically a string to some kind of value. It doesn't matter what the value is. The value could be a string, it could be an int, it could be a double. Um, and one of the most important properties of this is that it's not really orderable. Now you might say, well, this is clearly an order because you know these months are in order, but that's just a meaning that you associate with it. For a computer, that order might not mean anything. And another example of, of a um, 
you know, an associate kind of relationship is like, let's say I'm storing a whole bunch of info about you all as students and I've got Ricardo here and Ricardo has a whole bunch of things associated with him. Like he's got, you know, an age of 19, you know, a, a grade of 99 like this. And these are all just pieces of information associated with Ricardo. Maybe this is a struct. Maybe this is a list. And then I could make another one for Matthew, who has like an age of 20, um, you know, and a grade of 98 like this and so forth. Um, but the point here is that if someone said to you, oh, can you order these students? It's like, no, I can't because this is not, I'm not storing these in an array. I, like an array would have an index. An array would be like index zero is you know some structure and index one is some structure so i'm not using indices here i'm using strings and therefore these are not ordered so that's a data structure that again if you've used python or javascript before you've seen these kinds of things this kind of structure exists in most languages except for c because most things in c we have to build ourselves um, and that's that's kind of what we're going to be getting into is how do we actually build a structure like this where we can map a particular string to a particular value instead of dealing with like array indices and stuff. And to do that, um, we need to talk about hashing. And hashing is where, and again, you can kind of do this in other languages, but not C, where you'd love it to say, like, you know how you can assign indexes on an array? Wouldn't it be great if we could say, you know what? I'm actually going to say that I have a courses object, struct, whatever, and the index comp 3311 is called database systems. And then I want to print out a string, which is the value at this particular index. So essentially in this example, instead of using indexes, instead of using integers to look up particular values, I want to use strings. That makes a lot more sense sometimes, right? Like that seems a lot easier to work with um, rather than being like courses zero is like, like it gets really confusing really quick. So this is a very powerful way to work with computers. The problem is in C is that whether we want to do this or not, and this is true for most other languages under the hood, is that all of these arrays, all of these lists or whatever, they still always need to work with numbers. There's no such thing as being able to pass a string index into an array. It's just not possible. Every array has to take an integer index. So what we would love to do is to be able to define a function, we're just going to call it h, that converts a string to a number. So that when we want to assign a particular index of our courses array to database systems, to the value database systems, we can actually just take our um, string comp3311 and call the h function on it, which just converts it from a string to an int. So h just converts from characters to a number. Um, and therefore we could actually give it to this array. So this would be like a little bit of a fun way, like in theory, if you imagine this magical function h, don't worry about how it works yet, that just turns strings into indexes and now suddenly we can do what we want, which is we can have these nice little string indexes, which are a lot easier to read, maybe easier to work with, can simplify our data structures, uh, and it's consistent with the limitations of C. And the way this would work is if you had a key here like ABC, and you wanted to put it inside of your array, you could just call the H function on it, and the H function might just turn it into the number three. Why? Don't know. We'll talk about that later. But it's like it converts a string to a number, and then you can insert it at that number. So therefore, the value associated with the key ABC can get put at this part of the array. So we need a we need a smart array. We need a smarter way to um, convert these strings in, into numbers, into integers, so that we can actually use an array to store these kinds of associative to use these associative containers. So one way to do that is to think about um, kind of a what we call like a hash table or a hash structure um, and you can think about it like an ADT and essentially uh, you got to think about a hash structure like an array except things are looked up not by index but they're looked up by string. Now this is consistent with what we've said before. Um, the real question is how do we turn a, a string into a number and that's this thing here, this H or what we call a hashing function. That we're going to get into more detail after, but for now, again, I just want you to imagine that given any string, we have this magical function h that can just turn it into a, an array index for us. So it helps us map strings to particular indexes um, in an array. So how we might actually work with a uh, hashing-like structure in reality is that you might have a key like this, which is comp3311, um, and then you have the value, 
this is the thing that the key points to or the key references, right? Like you're familiar with this. You have things in your life that have names. Your computer has a name. All of the, all of the computers on your network have names, right? Like mine's like Hayden dash desktop or something. Um, lots of things in your life are categorized by names. I'm sure you have a whole bunch of toys. Does everyone have a bunch of teddy bears on their bed? You know, you don't, you don't call it teddy bear zero and teddy bear one, right? Like they've got a name, um, however many you have. And that's how you think of them. So we, we want to maintain that, that idea that we can label things by a name rather than by a number. So we've got our key and we've got our value. We're saying this name refers to this value. It's the same thing as an array, except instead of an index referring to a value, it's just a string refers to a value. Then what we have is we have this theoretical data structure, which we haven't implemented or defined too heavily, which um, is essentially an associative container uh, where we have a hash insert and a hash get. So it's basically like an array insert and an array get, or a linked list insert and a linked list get. A hash is just a type of structure we have. And courses refers to the structure itself, right? Um, and then what this is saying is that I would really like to insert into our string indexed array um, based on this index, which is a string, and this is the value I'd like to put at that string. And then when we get something out of that structure, we can say, hey, I'd actually like to get something out of this structure get me the value that's at this index because 3311 in this case refers to like an index, like a number, but remember we're dealing with strings. So this is what a hash structure is, forgetting how it's implemented for a second. It's a really handy way where we can actually build up a data structure that's string indexed instead of array indexed. Um, yes. Now, one th the things we need to keep in mind when thinking about this data structure are that um, if you're sitting there, like, I wonder what you're all thinking about, but it's like, okay, so we kind of get, um, we kind of get that maybe we have this, uh, this array here. And this array has a whole bunch of indexes. And they all have different values in them. Right? And these indexes are named from, you know, 0, 1, Right, like two, three, four, all the way up to like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I'm just adding some of them in. And we know that um, what happens is is that when you have a string, like say comp two five two one, when we call H on comp two five two one, it might give us a number like five. Like that. So when we have this value associated with this we can go and fill this value in here, right? So instead of like, this has an index of five. So the index that correlates to the string, comp2521 is five. So we know where to put that in the array. And then similarly, let's say for a second, we want to insert something else into our array, which might be comp1511. Then let's say that correlates to seven. I go, oh, okay. Well, I can go put this in my array now too, because even though you've given me a string, which makes no sense as far as C arrays are concerned, I know how to convert that string to a number, and therefore I know what spot to put that in the array. So that's, that's what's happening here as part of hashing. One of the problems with hashing though that we have to think about is that, look at this line here, the set of key of strings, um, sorry, I'm just let me, Okay, let me read this through properly. I jumped ahead a few lines. You have to think about that what we have here is a whole collect. Yeah, so Matthew's kind of getting it. Um, we have a whole collection of strings. Now, let's imagine that, you know, for some reason, let's imagine these are all UNSW course codes. Okay, well, what are UNSW course codes made up of? They're made up of four chars and then four numbers. So what's the total space of that? Well, how many chars are there? Let's just say 26 because they're all uppercase. Plus how many numbers? 10 because they're all... Um, you know, it's 10 numbers times 4. What's that? 26 to the power of 4 plus 10 to the power of 4 gives us 496,000 or whatever. So that's how many possible different combinations of 4 character, 4 numbers we can have. Right? Now, what... Th so this is what you might call like the domain... <coughs> domain of the keys. Is big. It's like a half million. There's like a half million different unique strings we can have. But here's the problem. Our array is not going to be half a million in size. Right? Our array is going to be smaller than that. In this case, we only have 14 elements. So the domain of our array 
at the moment is just equal to 14 elements. Now, obviously, this could be bigger, this could be 1,000, this could be 10,000, whatever, but it's probably not going to be 500,000. That's really, 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 really big. Um, and also, if you just added a few more characters to this, it would get unmanageably large. So what that means we're dealing with is we're dealing with a particular scenario where the domain of the keys that we have to work with, the, like the, the different possibilities of strings that we have greatly exceeds the number of elements we're going to have in our array in the majority of cases. That's just a fairly standard thing that happens with this structure. There's also a constraint that we want on our hash um, function such that like, I mean, this is all a bit, this is more just kind of like formal here, but the idea, ah, I mean, that speaks for itself. I don't need to go through that. You, you kind of get the idea here that if our hash function needs to somehow turn all 500,000 different strings into a series of indexes that can fit within an array that's smaller than it, we're going to have some issues where the h function turns two strings into the same number. We're going to eventually run into some cases where the h function tries to say run on like, you know, comp1531, and it also gives five. And then we've got a problem here because now suddenly we want to put two things at the same spot. That's an issue that we're going to get to later, possibly on Thursday. In the meantime, though, um, a lot of what we're about to talk about in terms of implementation, just to keep things simple, are going to focus on forgetting about that collision possibility. Right? So the idea in the early stages, just while we try and understand these functions and how they work, is to assume that we're going to just be dealing with cases where each string kind of gives you its own unique number and we don't have these two things kind of point to the same to the same index. But that's obviously a possibility and you all picked up on it quickly, which is why we're mentioning it early. Like, it's just common sense. If your string space is bigger than the space of numbers you convert to, you're, e like, you're going to have some double ups. Um, that makes sense. Like, if I tried to give every student at UNSW a unique number between 1 and 100, you're going to have some duplicates, and that's going to create problems for us. But for right now, let's just pretend that the space we're working with is the same space as, like, the size of our array, just so we can understand how this structure and, more importantly, hashing works. Um, firstly, just in terms of our hash table ADT, uh, thankfully, by this point in the course, we're so familiar with ADTs that I'm hoping this is quite digestible in terms of we have a struct that's a hash table representation. It's abstract. I don't know how that's implemented. That's fine. We'll worry about that later. And I have a pointer. I have a, I have a name called hash table, which is a pointer to a struct like that. And then the functions I have are relatively um, standard. I have to create a hash table where an int is the maximum size, right? It's the size of your array. It's a little bit like a heap. You have to specify, like, do you want it to be a million items or a thousand items or 10,000 items? We can insert into the hash. Um, I think that's missing a key. Oh, it depends how you implement it. But typically this hash insert here should be like, you insert into a hash table and you give it a key and an item. Right, because if I'm ever doing any kind of associative ordering to you, and like if I want to write down a note that's like, um, you know, let's say you're recording all of the, you know, the, the weights of your teddy bears on your bed, it's like you're like, all right, well, you know, Pongo is is um, three kilograms, and and Daisy's two kilograms. Like you're writing the name that identifies it, and the the information associated with that name. So whenever you insert stuff you'd probably want to have the key here as well. There's reasons that I think this implementation that I've, I've ported over doesn't have that, or maybe it was a typo, but I think I understand why that's the case. Um, if we want to get something out, like let's say you want to find a particular teddy bear's weight, um, then you can say, I've got the hash table, I'm going to look up Pongo's weight, and then the hash get will return you a pointer to that particular set of values. Um, maybe it's a struct, maybe it's an int, like this could be anything. It's essentially a bucket of values associated with a particular key. Um, and then we can delete our we can delete something from our hash table if we want. That's saying you know let's say that um, I don't know Pongo dies and you want to just say okay that information isn't relevant anymore. You just get the hash table, you give it that key, the name that identifies it, and then you say let's remove the information associated with that. And then you obviously have the drop hash table thing, which is freeing it. Like you know we actually have to free up the memory. Um, yeah. So Walid says it's probably to abstract away the hashing function so the user isn't concerned with it, could just easily run the hash function inside the insert. 
Um, yep. Um, if, if the actual key is part of the item, then you can run the hash function inside the insert. And um, I mean, the hash function is always going to run inside the insert. You know, it's an abstraction. Um, yeah, I'm not very nice to teddy bears, I guess. Rest in peace, Pongo. Um, yeah. So that's the ADT. Create, destroy, add, delete, get. Fairly standard semantics that we've seen before in other kinds of ADTs. The real question is, how is this implemented? Um, this is all of the code here. Um, and basically, the hash table itself um, is a... In this case, it's a collection. It's, a, it's an array of pointers to items. Um, in this case, that's because it's assuming that the hash table doesn't actually store the memory itself. It just stores pointers. Like, it assumes that, um, you know, if you have, like, if you have a key here that points to a value and that value is, like, a big chunk of data, that when you insert that, like, key into an array that you're not actually copying that value in. It's assuming that, like, you're just storing, like, a pointer here to that value, but this implementation, again, it could be different. Like, you could be storing the actual data inside the hash table, though this particular implementation is storing an array of pointers. Yeah? Um, so, our hash table has to store an array of pointers, where each pointer points to, like, the value associated with a given key. It stores the total size of the array. That's the initial array that you malloced at the start. So, what's the, the maximum number of elements you can store? And then it stores the number of items currently filled in it. So, you know, if, you're hashed, if, you've, if you've hashed five things, if you added five things to your hash table and they've been inserted, that value is now five. Now, creating a hash table, again, this is such so similar to heap that I don't want to dwell on it, but it's like you've got to create your struct, you've got to create your array, malloc both of those things, you've got to set your two variables. And in this case, you have to go through your entire array of items and um, set everything to be null, right? You have to initialize it because when you, when you malloc memory, it's all just, you get given a chunk um, and you have to make sure it's the right stuff. So there's always a cost to initializing it. Um, Matthew says, who named a variable new? Uh, I'm ashamed to say that I didn't write this code. This is from a previous term. Um, I clicked back, sorry. But, um, so, you know, I'd love to say I wrote all of this, but I didn't. And it, someone has used the variable new, which is very bad, naughty. So, um, but, you know, I'd probably make other mistakes if I wrote it. So creating a hash table makes sense. And then we're just left with four different functions, insert, get, delete, and drop. Now drop makes sense. Um, you've seen this from your own structures. You have to, you know, if you have a, a struct of lists, if you have a struct that contains a list, you have to free all the elements in the list. Um, yep. And you have to free the actual struct itself. Sorry, I'm just interested in this structure um, I don't know it's just kind of weird to me I guess because again I didn't write this code specifically but I'm just looking at it now and I'm just like I don't know if that makes sense because we're doing like here we only did two malics we did a malic for the array and we did a malic for the hash table whereas here it looks like we're doing a free for every element in the array and then we're freeing the hash table but we're never actually freeing the array itself. Someone have a look. I don't know. I, I don't trust myself to think critically while I'm talking. But tell me if I'm crazy there. I might be crazy. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Like freeing is like freeing is usually a very simple function because you're just unwinding what you did at the start. The things I want to kind of point you to are both the insert um, and the delete because they kind of are what actually deals with this magical h function, the one that turns a string into an int. And in this case here. Um, we're calling it hash. So instead of an h function, we're calling it a hash function. So when I try and insert, right, into a hash table, I get all the stuff I want, which is like the key and the values and stuff. And what I do is I generate a hash for it. So this line here, 19, what it does is it takes in that item, which contains the key, and then it generates a hash. So this line 19 is this step here. It's like, it's hashing this. It's taking a string and it's turning it into a number. Um, 
Yes. So that's what it does here. It takes a string and it turns it into a number and that number is h here. So h refers to the index that you want to insert into this array with. Then the next line, um, we insert into that particular index a copy of it. Oh, now I see why it's doing that. I think we're still missing a free somewhere. Um, yeah, okay. Now I see. That's why you should read things in order, everyone. So we're actually creating a copy of that item and we're storing it inside of our hash table and then we're increasing the number of items. So that's pretty similar to a normal kind of uh, array insert and it's a very similar logic to what we saw with the heap. It's just in a heap we were always adding things to the end. With the hash table you're adding things into random spots. Which, you know, a little bit more chaotic. So we're adding things into random spots. Now when we want to get something out of the hash table, we take in a hash table, we take in a key, the key's a string, we then say, what is the index that that string refers to? So we hash the key. We turn a string into a number, and that tells us the index that our item's at, and then we grab our item from that index. Now, some of the logic here relies on the fact that this particular implementation of hash tables assumes that when you have a key like comp1 or comp3311, that the value is typically a struct that contains the key too, or something like this. And then it also contains all the other values like name, database systems, um, years, three, like, like it, it assumes that the actual value contains the key. Um, that's why you'll see some funny things happen here, like uh, somehow just magically getting the key from the value. And, and the idea is that it, un under this hash map model, um, every every value that you insert into a hash map should have the key kind of tied into it. And then similarly here, this is just a check we have to make sure that like when we pull an item out of the hash map, that it actually has the right key, but largely you can ignore these, these four lines here. It's mainly just like you get a string that's the key, you hash it into a number, you get the element at that index from that hash number, and then you return that. Um, hash delete is... Yeah, this is just interesting. Um, yeah, so hash delete here, we, similar thing, it's like get, we take in a hash table, we take in a key, we then hash the key, which is a string, so we turn a string into a number, which is h, we look up that number, and then we're going to free it this time. So instead of returning it, we're going to free it, set the actual, like, array cell to none, to null, and then we're going to decrement the number of items in the array. So again, this is this is honestly just like an array insert removal thing in a lot of ways, except we're inserting into kind of random indexes based on that um, hash function. <coughs> if all of that makes sense, and please tell me if there's some more questions people have on it, we can start to understand the hash function now, which is so far this thing that we've kind of, you know, treated very abstractly. At its highest level, um, a hash function is a function that takes in a key, which is your string. Every time you see key, just think string. And it takes in a number n, which is typically the size of your hash table. And it usually turns your string into a number. Any number, it could be a billion, it could be two, it could be five, it could be a trillion. And then it returns that number mod n. Now, the reason for this is because if I have a structure like this, where we have 14 elements, and I have a hash function, I, I try and hash the, you know, let, let's look at this. So I'm going to say I'm going to hash comp2521, and I give it the size of the array, like this. The hash function could generate a number that's like, like, you know, let's say it turns that string somehow into this number. The problem is I can't return that number because that number has to be an index. So no matter what number is generated, I have to return it mod 14. So that every, sing so that every single number that I, I get is eventually collapsed into something that can fit inside that array. So all hash functions generally follow the same process. It converts a string into a number, maybe a big number, and then that big number gets modded to something quite small. And you can actually start to see here how the collisions happen because um, if you had an n that was as big as the domain space, then you probably wouldn't have many collisions or many overlaps. 
Whereas here, because n is always going to be so much smaller than the number of different possibilities that could happen here, you're eventually going to have duplicates. So, um, it's a function that turns a string into an int, some int by some rule, magic. Think of it like a random number to start off with, but that's not quite right. Um, and then it mods it to make sure it fits within the array. Uh, what we want to try and make sure is that the hash of different strings ideally aren't equal. Because if, if you hash cat and you hash dog and you mod them by n as part of the function and you get the same index like index 8, now suddenly you're going to have overlap and duplicates and all those other problems. And that's what we don't want to see happen. Right, so we want to avoid those kinds of duplicates, which is what we'll talk about tomorrow more. Um, a couple of example hash functions. These were, I think, I don't know if John pulled these, John Shepard. I'm guessing he did because one of them is a Postgres DBMS example. But here are two example hash functions that, that are, um, this is a universal hashing function on the left. And this is a hashing function that exists as part of a database implementation. And you can see the hashing function on the left, it takes in a string that's a key and an N. It, it does a whole bunch of random math that's like, I create three ints and then a char star pointer and then I go through each character and then I m to say A is now equal to A times B mod N minus one. And it's just, it's a whole bunch of, like think of it like a deterministic, confusing math of ma maths of maths. Um, and I say deterministic because I said before, I'll think of it like a random number. While it might appear like a random number, um, it's not actually a random number because if you run the same hash function again and again, you'll get the same value. So it's totally deterministic. The same key will always give you the same hash. That's really important. It's just like this is a bit of a gobbledygook mess that um, helps you just convert it to what a seemingly random disparate number. And then there's more complex hash functions like we have over here on the right um, where you take in a character, a, a character array, you take in an int, which I believe is the length of that array. Um, this one is doing it based on the null terminator. This one's obviously wanting the length. And then this one, I have literally no idea what it's doing. I just think it's interesting to demonstrate the complexity of it. It's doing a whole bunch of bit shifting. Um, yeah. It's doing these series. Yeah, it's, I have no idea what this is doing. I couldn't even begin to explain this to you. But what I do want you to notice is that in both of these cases, the last thing, the last operation that always happens is modifying the potential return value, modding it by n. So in this case here, while we do all this complex stuff, it still gets modded by n, which is the size of the array that we're hashing into. And then similarly here, this is the size of the array we're hashing into. So we're always modding the h value by that to make sure that um, it always fits in the array. Um, so the problem, I'm sorry, I was just thinking about some things. The problem with all of this, as we've talked about at the start and we've had people ask about throughout, um, is that there are sometimes duplicates or what we call collisions. And you can see here that, it, as we said at the start, if the size of the key space is greater than the size of the index space, if the size of all the different strings is greater than the space we have for the array, collisions are inevitable. Um, and collisions are cases when you have two keys that are not equal, but their hashes are equal. So if I hash two, comp2521 and I hash comp1511 and they both give me the same value, that's a hash collision and that's going to create problems for us. What are the problems it's going to create for us? Well, there's two immediate ones. One is that where do we store it? How do we store two different things at the same spot? There's a few ways we can solve that, which we're probably going to talk about tomorrow instead. I think we might wrap up soon because I don't want to get into it with 15 minutes left. Um, so we could store things, we could try and figure out how to store multiple things at the same spot. The other problem it's going to have is that one of the benefits of hash maps or hash tables that we've kind of glossed over since the start is that they have an incredible property, which is they have an O1 lookup time and an O1 insert time and an O1 delete time. Hash, hash tables are not very space efficient. 
by virtue of the fact that you need to kind of pre-allocate this giant array, um, particularly when they've yet to be filled or when they're sparsely filled. However, they have an incredible, incredibly fast lookup um, time because a hash function, while it looks complex, it's still constant time. As in, it doesn't matter how many elements you have in the array. It doesn't matter what element it is. The hash function is still just some amount of time. It's just, you know, process a bunch of math and there's your index. So essentially, it's like if you want to if you want to like get your value at a particular index, you can just get it instantly, and you can insert it instantly too in theory. So it has very similar pro properties to an array in the sense that lookup is instant because you essentially are looking up by an index. It just happens that your index comes from a string that you have to mangle to get to an index, um, and the insert's very quick too because unlike an array, you don't have to reshift things all the time. You're kind of inserting into quite disparate spots in an array. Now naturally that slows down as you start to have overlaps and stuff. But you could imagine that if you have, you know, a thousand item hash table and you're inserting values into it, those first inserts are going to be really quick because they just get put in, you know exactly where they are. There's no lookup. So you have 01 lookup, 01 insert, 01 delete. That's really cool. And that's why these structures are really um, kind of, I guess, popular for um, like fast algorithms. Because you can essentially store values with O1 lookup. Um, yeah, sure, like binary trees have ON lookup, but that's also assuming that they're balanced. And to balance a binary tree, you often need to do other operations too. Uh, so it's a great way to kind of cache things. It's a great way to keep a, a set of things as well, um, like a visited set. Like we, we talked back in week five about graphs. Um, and we know that with graphs, you keep a visited array, we called it. But it's like arrays are complicated because if you have 50 items in the visited array, to check if your item's there, you have to loop through all the values. So there's actually like an ON cost to like looking up a visited array. So <clears throat> hashes have a, have a really great properties for performance and like lookup and deletion and insertion. Um, unless you have too many collisions, then things get more complicated. Um, so ideally, the search cost of a hash table is O1. Now, I don't want to get into it now again because we only have like 10 minutes left. So we'll finish off the second half of hashing tomorrow where we talk about collisions and how to deal with them. And then we'll talk about tries tomorrow. But before we wrap up for today, does anyone have any last lingering questions? Um, I'll answer a few questions before we wrap up. Matthew says, so hashing is an O1 array. Um, it's not an O1 array. It's like it uses an array to, to store itself. It has O1 lookup, insertion, and deletion until hashes collide. And hashes do collide because your, your key space is nearly always much bigger than your index space. So in ideal circumstances, with a lot of memory or a really small key space, hashes are O1. Yes. But once you start getting into collisions, it gets more complicated. And the, the insertion and the lookup um, and the deletion then can very quickly not become O1. And that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. But yes, ideally hash maps can be O1, which is an extremely useful thing. And if you ever get into any high performance algorithms, it's like um, any kind of hash structure is just remarkably quick, which is great. Um, when is hash better than array? Uh, so the... Hashes are great when you're trying to store information that's associated with a string and you don't need that information to have a sense of sequence. That's the main one. Um, you could use them in a lot of scenarios, but generally speaking, again, it's whenever your data is identified by a string and it doesn't, have, it doesn't need a sense of sequence with respect to other values. Um, so you could definitely use them more often. Um, when is assignment 3 due? Oh, that's a secret. Um, that's a secret. I might not answer too many off-topic questions, but um, Max says, not related to content. Marks are out now. When will feedback marking be released? Um, marks are probably out now because there's a property that's been set on... Like, so we mark with a system and then those marks get put into another system. So here's here's your actual info on your mark. Here's where the, 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 the final mark stored. WebCMS3 pulls from both of those for different reasons. And I believe for some reason or another, intentionally or unintentionally, we've given you access to that. Um, 
So you probably see your mark now, but I, I just think I want to stress a couple of things. One is that we'll be releasing your actual like marked with feedback stuff probably on Saturday is the aim. So Saturday is when we want to have that released. Uh, your mark is subject to change too. So like if you have a mark now, A, don't get attached to it. It might go up, it might go down. B, don't email your tutor. Don't email your tutor asking about it. If you love your tutor, just leave them alone until they've marked everything. And then you can email them and you can talk to them next week. And everything's all, you can have all that opportunity. But, you know, just for now, that's, don't read into that too much because it's subject to change. And I don't want to, I don't want to have anyone kind of be like, oh my God, something happened. But that's, that's the background on what, what that is. Um, is optimizing your data to be more easily hashed better? Uh I've never really come across a scenario like that. It's like, okay, so like the, the simplest thing is that uh, in, in a language like Python, and I'm just going to use Python here because it's easy. If you have a series of objects such as name, Hayden, and age 28, which is how old I am now, um, there might be a temptation, and let's do Kevin. I'm just going to guess that Kevin is 22. I don't know. It's a mystery. I don't know why that was a string. If you have like a couple of structs or dictionaries or objects like this, the, the kind of naive way to do things is to create like a list of some sort and then to like add, add those things to a list. Like let's say this is A and then this is B. Is you just kind of like add these to a list. Um, the problem is though that when you then want to look up say a person by their name you then have to go through each list item to like ch compare particular string values so the most common case of, of a hash table is a case where you do it, you're doing something like this where you basically have a collection of items that have a unique identifier that's a string and you think hey if i put them in a list i'm going to be dealing with potentially o n lookup times but if i put them in a hash table i might be dealing with best case o one lookup times um and that's what that's that's the case there um Dear Aurora says, in the example of subject names, surely we could restrict the key space because not all four-letter combinations would be valid. Yes, that's correct. Um, half a million was a very over-the-top estimate, though in reality, the real key space would probably still be bigger than an array you'd want to allocate. So I was just trying to get the general picture, but you're correct. Um, when will I talk about the exam lecture stuff? That'll be next Tuesday. Next week, we talk about exam and revision. Um, in the meantime, I don't know if I ever released this page. Sorry if I didn't, but I didn't. I'll do that right now. Um, actually, I've got to make sure I finished it. Did I finish it? I hope so. Anyway, I put up this page because I said we put it up in week nine. Um, this gives you a rough overview. Don't ask me questions about it now. I'm very serious. I'm not trying to be all grumpy and stuff. It's just like um, I... This is here so you can start thinking about things, but next week I'd rather just have all the exam questions be asked in a lecture and we can just talk through it all there so that when people want to learn more, they can just like look in one spot. Um, but this is like the gist of it. Um, go read that in your own time. We'll talk about it next Tuesday. You have a whole assignment to do and your exam isn't for like a few weeks at least. So um, we'll talk about that one next week. Um, and then last question, Trent says, is there a reason the slides highlight the fact that we don't want hash cat n equals hash act n? Or is that just a common pitfall? That's a really excellent question, Trent. Um, I kind of glossed over that because I didn't think it was like, wasn't like an earth changing, earth shattering. Where's it go? So I'm just looking for it. Hash table, hash function. Uh, yeah, so um, if I asked you to write a really simple hash function, you might say something like, oh, I'll just, I'll just get the length of the string. Done. Right? So if I have a three-character three string, the hash is three. If I have a four-character string, the hash is four. That's way too simple. Way, way, way too simple. Um, so you might think, oh, I have a better idea. I will sum up all the ASCII characters in that string, and then I'll hash it. That's much better than the length, but it's still not perfect. So that's essentially what these two dot points here are referring to. It's like, 
you prefer not for strings of the same length to be the same hash and you prefer for strings of the same characters not to be the same hash because really simple hashes would probably follow fall fall into those as you referred to it um pitfall uh, yeah it would have those common pitfalls so yes you're exactly right on that one um, I'm sorry that the exams in the mornings, I don't control exam times. I ask UNSW for afternoon exams constantly, reminding them that students in Asia and India have trouble with earlier exams, though their usual comment is that there are other big courses too, but I still think this is a very big course, so I'm not sure. I'm not in control of it, and I'm sure they do the best they can. Um, cool. All right, well, I think that's... I think any other questions just post on the forum, but let's wrap up for today. Um, it was nice to see you all and we'll chat again on Thursday and we'll keep talking about the rest of hashes. And um, yeah, sounds good. I hope you're all staying safe. Um, I told my C++ tutor this morning, I live in Camp C at the moment. And if you Google Camp C, uh, it's, it's COVID hell here. So pray for me. Um, and I'll pray for you that no one catches COVID. Look out, look after yourselves. Um, and see you on Thursday.